The PS2 era of Mega Ten consists of quite a few titles that many people are fond of. There's the obvious Persona games that will never die. Then there are some of the more cult classics, like the Digital Devil Saga and Raido duologies. And of course, there's the one, and only, Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. I'm sure this game needs no introduction. SMT3 Nocturne would be the first, uh, second foray into the third dimension for the mainline series. Nocturne has gained a bit of a reputation for being difficult for newcomers of the series, while simultaneously being touted as one of the best entry points. Oh, what a dilemma. For a first time playthrough, sure, it could be pretty brutal, but to the guy who's played Nocturne a thousand times, they probably know every exploit. For the people who played the HD remaster, they might not have found it that hard at all, given the quality of life and grinding DLC they added. I'm sure these people are probably yearning for that magical first Nocturne experience again. When the game truly tested your limits and it truly felt difficult. Well, while you can never experience Nocturne for the first time again, you can try to recapture that sense of challenge. We've all seen plenty of people do it. I'm sure you've seen low level runs, no fusion runs, no buffs or debuffs, no protagonist. Sure, self-imposed challenges are a good way to artificially recreate the good old Nocturne challenge. But what about the good old days when the challenge just came naturally? The thrill of an unrestricted challenge where your only solution is to go all out. That is exactly what a certain ROM hack advertises itself as. I'm sure most of you out there have at least heard of it before. Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne Hard Type. This hack has been around for a while. It's something I've seen plenty of gameplay footage of on YouTube, and something people in the community always seem to be aware of, based on my own personal experiences discussing SMT. However, I have yet to find anyone who's shared an in-depth perspective, at least not in video form. Which is why I, a random person on the internet, have taken it upon myself to give a comprehensive breakdown of this hack and share my thoughts with you. I'll be formatting the video like so. Instead of simply reading down the list of changes, I'll go over where the game improves upon the original and the areas I don't think Hardtype really fixes the game. I'm sure most of you watching this are already familiar with the story of Nocturne, so I won't bloat the video even further by re-summarizing those events. There are plenty of videos out there that already do that. I'm going to focus primarily on the gameplay experience. Now, without further ado, let us begin. One thing I really like that I don't see often in other difficulty hacks is how well Hardtype eases you into it. It doesn't immediately throw you into hell like a lot of other ROM hacks that pride themselves on their challenge. It subtly introduces the gameplay changes in the early game. At the start of the game, you'll immediately notice that you can actually see all the skills you can learn on your initial Magatama. You'll also notice the difference in skills it imparts on you. Most notably, you gain access to a magic-based damaging skill. Without even really doing anything, you get a good taste of how much more breathing room you have. You normally don't get any real magic skills until after the first boss fight. In Hardtype, you get Death Touch, a light almighty attack that drains HP. This means anyone looking to go for a magic build can immediately start investing into it and taking advantage of their magic stat. Once you reach the first boss fight, Forneus, you get a demonstration of another mechanical change. In the original game, a target that's been shocked or frozen will remain in that state until the start of their side's turn. This leaves them vulnerable to guaranteed crits for a whole round of turns. Hardtype changes this so those statuses only last through one physical attack. In exchange, however, more bosses can be shocked or frozen, so you can better take advantage of this mechanic. A good chunk of new early Magatama skills are skills that have secondary effects on top of dealing damage. For example, Scald deals fire damage to all enemies while also debuffing their physical attack, while Chill deals ice damage to a single enemy while lowering their hit and evade rate. 
Even Matador, despite not being much harder than his original counterpart, has a skill demonstrating a similar capacity in Dervish. More physical skills were added early game too, as those were pretty sparse early on in the original game. For early parts of the game, hard type allows the player to warm up to the changes before really turning up the heat. Obviously, the early bosses have more HP, but in terms of challenge, I'd say it's pretty similar to the original game. The mandatory Dante fight is your first real examination of your skills. So at this point, you've gotten a good taste for how helpful buffs and debuffs are. Not only on their own, but as a secondary effect on offensive skills. Dante is the epitome of that. A lot of Dante's signature skills now have some type of debuff effect added to them. If you let him stack too many on you, this can put you at a huge disadvantage. Remember, the enemy can still stack 4 debuffs on you. You'll have to manage both optimizing damage and preventing his debuffs from getting out of control. In the original game, this isn't really something you deal with until around mid-game. You're expected to learn how to deal with it earlier here. I used Rakukaja to counteract his defensive debuffs. I actually got pretty lucky too, he used bullet time which killed one of my demons and also confused me. But I won by a lucky counterattack which activates regardless of ailments. Naturally, the HP of enemies scales up more in hard type compared to the original. But I honestly didn't find most of the mandatory story bosses too terribly difficult. Random encounters are also mostly the same, but something new was added to make them more taxing on the player. We'll put a pin in that for now though. For now, I want to focus on bosses. Thankfully, a few of the laughably easy ones from the original have up to the ante. The most standout one for me was Sakahagi. He now has 20,000 HP, and now has attack all, might, and pierce. Where most of the difficulty amplifying went towards was the optional boss fights, especially the ones for the true demon ending. The early fiend fights aren't too terrible, but Black Rider, Pale Rider, Mother Harlot, Trumpeter, and Metatron actually made me do extensive preparations for them. While level grinding was almost non-existent, I definitely had to farm a lot of money for these fights. That might have been my own fault though. I completely neglected life gain and life surge for half the game. The damage for late game bosses is a lot higher than I remember playing OG Nocturne. I feel like a large portion of my fusion sprees around that point of the game was just trying to acquire that skill. I also took much more advantage of Rag's jewelry. Aside from consumable items, I made much better use of Mitamas. While the stat boost cap was nerfed, they're still a valuable asset if you want to fill up any empty skill slots on your demons. Something that I didn't know about Mitamas is every time the moon phase changes, there's a random chance that special Mitamas will be available for grabs. These Mitamas will be slightly higher leveled and might have some extra skills that might be really nice to have, specifically void skills. You can also fuse your own Mitamas if you have your own skills you want to give to your demons. While this was always a thing in Nocturne, it wasn't until hard type that I even considered using Mitamas other than for stat boosting. Luster candies were also added as an item you can make with gems and they happen to be made using three of the gems you can get from black boxes at the junk shops. This incentivizes farming lucky tickets. Hard type made me consider mechanics that I never thought of using and also encouraged galaxy brain level demon fusions, some of which are the most fun I've had with demon fusing in a while. What I really like about making specifically the fiends and labyrinth bosses harder is that they make getting the Lucifer ending a much greater commitment. If the challenge is too much for you or sounds too intimidating, this might actually be good incentive for the player to try going for one of the normal endings and save TDE for a new game plus run. Most people who play Nocturne almost always go for the true demon ending because it has the most content and the original game does not put up much of a resistance to that. This devalues all the other endings. In hard type, true demon ending is something that has to be earned, and I'd argue that this is a good thing. You know what else improved for the long run? Stats. 
It's no secret that Nocturne's stats kinda don't work. Or rather, the formulas that use said stats just render them useless. There are some pretty good videos out there explaining how they're poorly implemented. I guess we'll start with Magic, since that's the one that's gotten the most glow up. In the original game, Magic's damage starts to dwindle at higher levels. While most people probably wouldn't notice without being told this, it's still counterintuitive. Why not fix it, you know? Not only was the damage formula fixed, but a lot of fun new spells were added. Aside from the early game ones I mentioned, you also get really good mid to late game spells too. You can get the strongest electric spell, Mjolnir. While you don't get a lec boost until much later, preventing it from becoming too powerful for that point in the game. Meanwhile, Tornado, which was really busted for how early you got it in the original, is now slightly weaker. Magma Axis is also just straight up the strongest spell in the game now. It can't be drained or repelled. That in combination with boost passives and pierce bypassing magic resistance make it a really good alternative to Frey Kugel for magic focused builds. For my playthrough, I went for a mixed build and found using both physical and magic skills to be very satisfying. Luck also factors into magic accuracy now. Luck also actually affects things in hard type. It effectively did nothing in the original and didn't affect any of the things you'd think it would. Here it affects crit rate, magic accuracy, odds of landing ailments, and odds of landing instant death spells. Agility was supposed to affect evasion and accuracy in the original, but as you gain levels it requires more agility to even make a substantial difference. At high enough levels it doesn't even make a difference anymore. That's obviously fixed here, but I wouldn't worry too much about agility. I didn't focus too hard on agility or luck until near the end of the game. It seems as though the player's level relative to the enemies plays a much bigger factor in that. Though once you get your strength, magic, and vitality up to 30, you might as well start investing in them. You might even start making good use of one of their already existing perks from the original increasing mobility and odds of items appearing in the Labyrinth Warp minigame. Yet another invaluable resource that I would not have really thought of using in my original Nocturne playthrough. And now to answer the question lingering on all your minds. How hard is Lucifer? That's what you're really here for, right? Well, don't forget there's still one boss you have to fight before him, Kagatsuchi. He's no pushover. His signature moves have all been buffed significantly. He can now raise his stats by 6 stages and remove all your buffs and debuffs while dealing huge damage to you. As for Lucifer, he also received a lot of changes. Lucifer's basic attack no longer deals HP damage, but now drains your MP and only costs half a press turn for him. All of his puny weak spells from the original have been replaced with incredibly strong spells that are exclusive to him. They're so powerful that if you don't have magic resistance, these spells can just one-shot any demon. The amount of damage you can repel back at him should say enough. His Diorama heals significantly more. He can also just instantly debuff you by 4 stages in a single turn. And to top it all off, all of his spells have some type of secondary effect attached to them. This might sound extremely intimidating, and honestly, yeah, it is. I've seen a lot of people really struggle with these bosses on their first playthrough. I was not one of those people. I think I might have overprepared after hearing the horror stories about these back-to-back -back challenging fights and ended up beating them on my first try. Don't get the wrong idea, I'm not saying they're easy as pie. The final bosses have been significantly buffed compared to their original counterparts and I really appreciate it. I had the benefit of knowing exactly how to prepare for these fights. I farmed millions of maka and gems, I shuffled those randomized skills until I got as close to the best fusions as possible. I got pierce on all of my frontline demons and covered everyone's vulnerabilities. Even with life surge and maxed out buffs, Kagatsuchi's attacks were still threatening, and Lucifer was still extremely satisfying to beat. In the end, I was only able to do it with my plethora of resources at my disposal. 
If I had to sum up all the positives in one sentence, Nocturne Hardtype reworks the game in very simple ways, but they all cascade into an experience not only fresh for its new additions or what it fixes, but also in old features that you have more incentive to use now. While Nocturne Hardtype has a lot of good going for it, there are quite a few things that deter the common player from trying it. One of the things I wasn't a huge fan of was the full moon encounters. Don't get me wrong, I really like the idea of encountering stronger than usual enemies on a certain moon phase. I just don't really enjoy most of the encounters themselves. The first couple you encounter, like the slime at the medical center and the Fornius in Ginza underpass are fine. Once you get to Ikebukuro though, they start casting stuff like Dragon Eye. Every round sometimes. You're basically going up against a mini boss at that point. These fights can very easily catch you off guard. You basically need to come into a lot of these fights at 100%. But realistically, that's not always going to be possible. At least not early game when your resources are more limited. Estoma was also weakened in this game, so even if you see the encounter coming, there's basically no avoiding it. Running away is possible, but very unlikely, unless you're leagues above the enemies there. Trafuri was removed, so demons can't learn it anymore, and fast retreat hardly helped in my experience. Ready or not, here they come. Oh yeah. When you get to Asakusa Tunnel, make sure you don't have any demons weak to force before a full moon encounter. If Sarasvati strikes your weakness and gets an extra turn, she will cast Dragonite infinitely, and you'll be softlocked. This is the only instance I could find where an enemy script was broken, other than sometimes running away right after giving themselves more press turns, if that counts. To its credit, the full moon encounters in normal dungeons become much more manageable in the latter half of the game. The Labyrinth of Amala, on the other hand, they're not even worth fighting. Those are the ones you want to save your smoke balls for. I did encounter a Hellbiker right after receiving 250,000 Maka from that one demon, but I was well above his level at that point. The later Kalpas get pretty crazy though. You can encounter the Riders, Trumpeter, Trumpeter summons Mother Harlot, and Beelzebub. On top of that, a lot of these full moon demons summon allies to draw the fight out even more. The glaring problem is that it's too random and even if it is possible to win, these fights only really succeed to eat up your resources, which are already scarce early on and you're encouraged to use them immediately when you really need to. Or at least that's typically the best use of your items in SMT. Another change I kinda disagree with is the new rules for buffs and debuffs. I can understand wanting to nerf them, because at 3 or 4 stages they can be ridiculously broken. But if you're gonna change the cap to 2 stages for the player, why does the enemy still get to stack 4 stages against you? Now, granted, this was never really a huge issue, as I would never even let the enemies get up to 4 stages. Tetracarn, Makarakarn, Attack Mirrors, and Magic Mirrors now only affect the user. At least, most of the time. There are still some bosses that can break the rules and cast party-wide barriers. Primary example being the Archangels. Don't get me wrong, these things don't ruin boss fights or anything, it just doesn't seem very fair in principle. Now, to be clear, I'd say overall that the creator of this ROM hack, Zombero, has a very good understanding of Nocturne's difficulty and balance. I think that the overall difficulty curve was handled pretty well, but I think he and many other people may have lost track of what made Nocturne's challenge interesting to begin with. Nocturne is one of the few RPGs I've played where the playing field is truly equal. All the same rules applied to both sides of the field. Same rewards, same penalties. The enemy can run away, I can also run away. I can summon other allies, the enemy can too. Hell, the only reason enemy skills like Beast Eye and Dragon Eye exist is to even out the playing field between the singular boss enemy and the player's four-man party. Personally, I would have just given the full moon encounters and bosses a couple more press turns straight out of the gate and toned down the usage of turn boosting moves. 
I'm cool with nerfing buffs and debuffs if it means that I get to keep track of less for both me and the enemy. I'm all for strong special encounters, that's not anything new for me. I'm even cool with previous bosses appearing as random encounters, but in the final dungeon. Now, of course, giving the enemy a slight edge over the player may be the point. Most difficult ROM hacks do pride themselves on their brutality towards the player. As I said before, I found the difficulty curve to be pretty fair for the most part. Maybe even more so than most difficulty hacks I've played. Some last few minor critiques. The HP of some of the later game bosses don't quite make sense. I'm not necessarily saying it's too much, I'm just saying they don't make sense. Like, the biggest example being Bisha Monten. Why does his first fight have more HP than his second? His stats in the first fight were changed to accurately reflect his stats as a usable ally, focusing around force instead of fire, and losing his ice weakness. Then for his second fight, he has 3000 less HP and reverts back to being a fire-based demon, and regains his weakness to ice. In fact, the Bando Shrine fights weren't changed all that much, aside from being stronger. The same can be said of Arimon, who is largely the same fight as in the original game, just more bloated with his massive HP pool. Arimon's total HP, counting both his phases, totals up to 91,000. That's even higher than Kagetsuchi's two-phase total of 80,000. To be fair, Kagetsuchi is able to heal himself a little bit, but I still don't think such an easy boss like Arimon needs to have that much HP. Noah's first phase has more HP than his second. Again, I know his second phase can drain you, but that's only like 500 to 600 HP every couple turns. I know in the grand scheme of things, these margins of error aren't that big. I just find them kind of odd. In game, the idea is supposed to be that the second phases of these fights are when the fight really begins. So you'd figure most of the HP would go to that phase, where the first phase would just be a warm-up. Perhaps I'm not really so much against the grand totals, and I'm just more puzzled by the distribution of them between phases. This last one I didn't observe for myself. This was pointed out by a user named Jim Reaper. Sure, all of you watching this have heard him, especially if you're a Nocturne fan. Apparently, Okuninushi doesn't resist fire, even though his status menu says he does. I don't know if there are any other demons with this error, but I, I don't know, I, I just keep an eye out for that. These things are pretty small in the grand scheme of things, though. In fact, all these small things just kind of culminate into one big thing. What is a truly balanced game? Do players actually want a game where the playing field is truly even, especially for a single player experience? I'd say it's less about balance and more about the perfect imbalance. Here's my little crackpot theory. Most people want an edge over the opponent to an extent, but not too much to the point where winning becomes unsatisfying. When the playing field is too even, the odds of winning become too close to 50-50. Giving both sides their own perks over each other can spice things up for an interesting challenge. It's so interesting to think about, honestly. Nonetheless, here's a montage of what were, in my opinion, the most challenging Nocturne hardtype boss fights for me. Along with the names of all my patrons. If you want to help make my life just a little bit easier, consider supporting me on Patreon. To all of my current patrons, thank you. The final question that's probably on your minds right now is probably, does Nocturne Hardtype replace the original? 
If you've seen my best version of every Persona game video, you already know that I never condone game-altering mods for a first playthrough. Bug fix patches, translation edits, and music patches are fine in my eyes, because they're restorative in nature. The goal of those is to preserve or reinstate the way the game was intended to be. Nocturne Hardtype is definitely not that. It's designed for people who have played the original game, and meant to be played on hard mode. Hell, even if you plan to play casually on normal mode, there are still things about it that make it inherently harder than the original, as the name implies. You still have to deal with full moon encounters, enemies have bigger HP pools, etc. There's also the debate over how hard Nocturne was to begin with. That's a discussion for another day, though. I've only played it on hard mode, so I might not be the best judge of this. If you're expecting this to be a complete replacement for the original, for most people, I would say no. Most people are looking to play these games casually, and I'd say Nocturne's normal mode is probably well suited for this already. Sure, the stats are bugged, but you never noticed until it was pointed out to you. Sure, the game can be really exploitable if you know how to, but that's the norm for any game, isn't it? In most cases, exploits are a byproduct of game design, not the go-to strategy. Some quick tips, a lot of which are redundant for anyone going into hard type for the first time. Do not neglect to at least accumulate a good number of demons with life gain or life surge. Late game bosses deal way more damage than you might be expecting. Get debilitate as early as you can so you can stop worrying about keeping track of all other debuff skills when passing on skills to new demon fusions. I got debilitate from Geary McCullough. Trust me, one less category of skills lifts a lot of weight off your shoulders. Carry a lot of smoke balls. You'll always want to have them in case a random encounter isn't working in your favor. Have a demon with stone hunt so you can always have the gems to make them. You only need to spend 1000 maka to get a lucky ticket at the junk shop. This makes it pretty easy to farm tickets, which can be turned in for prizes that you can farm for gems specifically the ones that can be used to make luster candy, and strong recovery items like great chakras, if you have the patience for it, that is. Passive anti-skills actually cover weaknesses now, so it's always a good idea to have them saved to some demons in your compendium. If you're lucky, those skills can mutate into void skills, or even repel or drain skills if you're lucky. You can easily fuse two of most demon races together to pass these skills onto an element, and fuse two elements into a mitama to then fill any empty skill slots on your current lineup. This can make or break the difference between a mediocre demon and a great demon. I know most of these are applicable to the original Nocturne save for the Luster Candy one, but if you haven't already been doing these things, start now. You'll thank me later. If you're going into hard type expecting it to fix everything wrong with Nocturne, you're out of luck. The things I critiqued in this video were for the most part exclusive to hard type. If I were to list off all the problems I had, the majority of them would be things that were already in Nocturne. The awful encounter rate is part of what makes preserving your resources a pain to begin with, and made full moon encounters more of a chore when they did come up. Some of the dungeons have you wandering around aimlessly, which leaves you open to even more encounters to consume your MP. The mere existence of moves like Dragon Eye make it hard not to rely on it to make fights harder. It's just such an easy way to allow setup for combos. The alternative to that we got years later to even the playing field was SMT4 Smirk, and that just added another element of randomness to the combat. But it's still not quite as insane as Pong the next level, just putting that out there. How do you make press turn combat more fair? There could be many solutions to this, but not everyone will agree which solution is the best. While I greatly appreciate the things Nocturne Hardtype does to fix and rebalance Nocturne, I'd say the best draw is that, for me, it was able to recapture that first Nocturne experience. Maybe not in the exact same way. I got stuck at different points and used different strategies, but just the thrill of facing interesting challenges, planning ahead, failing, 
and coming back to conquer those challenges is what made Nocturne Nocturne.